Yeah, so um, I've just slightly changed my title to the one I gave in the program. So instead of the first word unraveling, I've uh, include. I mean, I've changed that to uh, improving. Uh, so I'll tell you why uh, the change was made when you uh, listen to the uh, talk. So basically, as I said, I'm going to talk about a tool that is known as the barometer of life, uh, which is the IUCN Red List, uh, which I'm sure many of you would have already heard about, uh, about its application, about its uh, need, and uh, you know how it is being used by different uh, people across the world. So uh, basically, uh, no, uh, I'm sure SDG 14 would have been discussed uh, widely during the last uh, two days. Uh, so I'm not going to going into the detail of what uh, SDG 14 uh, means and uh, what uh, are the different targets that the world uh, governments need to uh, achieve in the next uh, nine or 10 uh, years. Uh, so uh, basically, so here you can see that uh, SDG 14 talks about how uh, we need to conserve and sustain the oceans of the world, uh, the resources that uh, live in these oceans, and how we can all uh, work together to ensure that there is a sustainable development by making use of these uh, resources. So the basic uh, question that uh, one needs to answer is uh, which species we need to conserve, uh, and of course, which areas or uh, sites we need to conserve. So this is basically the most fundamental question that uh, every uh, conservation biologist uh, needs to address. And uh, to answer this question, it's not really a, a direct or straightforward question to answer because we need uh, uh, lots of uh, you know, interdisciplinary knowledge uh, and information to uh, you know, start with. And then this knowledge and information should uh, be supported by uh, political will because not all governments, not uh, at the national or state level, will have the political will to uh, look after biodiversity or uh, conserve biodiversity. And even if there is political will, we need uh, money. So funding is important. So it's basically a combination of uh, knowledge, political will, and funding uh, that will help uh, conservation. And as you know, we are unable or we will not be able to uh, conserve and protect all the species of the world, all the uh, regions of the world, for that matter, which harbor biodiversity. So we need to uh, prioritize uh, which species we need to conserve, which areas we need to conserve. So prioritization is one of the most important uh, fundamental steps for uh, conservation. So uh, quickly to my outline of the talk. Um, so I'll talk about what the IUCN Red List is uh, and uh, why it is known as the barometer of life. I'll also talk about uh, the barometer of India's marine life, which is the focus of this talk today. Uh, I will then go on to the knowledge gaps and issues uh, that uh, India is facing uh, to improve the barometer of uh, marine life. I'll also uh, talk about uh, what uh, are the issues with globally prioritizing uh, conservation efforts and the locally uh, acting or acting locally to make making sure that these uh, conservation uh, uh, actions are done in the right way. And finally, some uh, points uh, so as to improve uh, India's, uh, uh, India's barometer of uh, marine life. So, the IUCN Red List is one of the most uh, popular uh, conservation tools that is being used around the world. And it has been in uh, practice and it has been uh, you know, helping conservation efforts for almost uh, 56 years. So, so almost for more than half a century, IUCN Red List is uh, being uh, used for uh, helping conservation around the world. So this is by far one of the most popular and one of the most uh, common conservation uh, prioritization tools that is being used uh, around the world. So basically the IUCN Red List uh, does a lot of things, but most importantly, it is uh, a tool that uh, tells you which species is at a high risk of extinction. And uh, many people think that the IUCN Red List is not uh, a very, uh, a serious uh, tool or a very, uh, what do you say, a robust uh, tool, basically because it is uh, you know, an, an output of a desktop uh, exercise, but uh, it is based on very uh, robust scientific uh, principles, uh, scientific concepts in conservation uh, biology, 
and for the iucn red list we make use of three most important uh, you know, knowledge uh, regarding uh, a species so you can see the three uh, points there the distribution range of the uh, species so where does the species live uh, what is the population um, or status or trends in that species whether the population is stable it's increasing decreasing etc and then the third most important point that we look at is what are the threats to the uh, survival of the species in the wild so it is a combination of all these three uh, knowledge or uh, information that finally is fed into uh, a software and the uh, you know software gives you the results of a uh, you know the conservation status of a, a species so it is objective uh, it is scientifically robust and and helps you uh, find the best uh, you know possible uh, prioritization uh, mechanism for uh, species uh, conservation So I use in Red List is known as a barometer of life, basically because it uh, provides uh, people with uh, an information on the pressure that uh, biodiversity around the world or the pressure that uh, ecosystems around the world is uh, facing. So currently, it is the most comprehensive inventory of the uh, conservation status of the world's uh, flora, fauna, and fungi. So you know it is a very comprehensive inventory. Uh, it tells you the uh, it tells you indications about the health of the world's biodiversity how good some species are doing how bad some species are doing uh, etc it also uh, most importantly you know helps as a tool or a policy tool to uh, catalyze action to develop policy frameworks across the world so it is basically uh, helping in uh, species conservation at various level from local to regional to national to global So this is the uh, most uh, recent uh, uh, information from the IUCN Red List. Uh, IUCN Red List updates uh, the species list on its website. Uh, now it's twice a year. It uh, usually it used to be twice a year. So the last uh, Red List update uh, happened in December uh, 2020. So uh, three months uh, ago, and uh, till uh, December 2020, there. are around 35000 uh, species around the world for which uh, the iucn has a red list uh, status so uh, 35000 species so which uh, basically means 35000 of the world species have been assessed uh, scientifically uh, objectively for the iucn red list out of which almost uh, 27% of the world's biodiversity is now threatened with uh, extinction so Uh, you may then feel that it is not a, a big number but uh, you know it also uh, shows you that uh, not all species of the world has been assessed so this number is only from uh, based on what whatever number of species have been assessed around the world so out of 35000 you know 27% of uh, the species are uh, threatened so and need uh, some sort of uh, conservation intervention in terms of research in terms of you know conservation action uh, etc so one of the uh, species uh, that iucn uh, profiled in their uh, or on their website uh, during the last update uh, was this uh, shark uh, carcadnus obsoletus which as you can see from the text uh, it says that it was only described in 2019 so which means the, uh, the shark was described only 2 years ago but then within uh, a span of uh, you know one year it was assessed as critically endangered and possibly uh, extinct so this is because the shark uh, you know was last recorded in 1934 but uh, the problem is it was not uh, uh, scientifically known uh, by a scientific or a species name so the species name was given only in 2019 but over the last uh, you know 80 or 90 years the habitat of the shark has been uh, you know Uh, modified extensively uh, in 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 the south china sea the second uh, aspect of this uh, species is that the south china sea is one of the most overexploited marine regions of the world and so the uh, the team that did this assessment uh, showed that no species could have persisted uh, under such heavy uh, fishing pressure and heavy uh, habitat modification and therefore this uh, species uh, was listed as uh, possibly extinct uh, species so this uh basically shows you that uh, even species that are you know uh, formally described very recently can you know, very quickly go into the iucn red list and reach their uh, you know highest uh, position so which is critically endangered possibly extinct so that's one step uh, just before uh, being declared as uh, extinct
So I'm not sure uh, how many people would have seen this very recent report, which came out uh, two weeks ago. Uh, this is a comprehensive report on the uh, conservation status of uh, marine biodiversity in the Western uh, Indian Ocean. Uh, so this uh, is one of the very few uh, literature we have that uh, compiles information on the conservation status of marine uh, biodiversity in this uh, you know, region that India is a part of. And uh, you know, if you look at this uh, publication, that gives you an idea about uh, what are the levels of threat for different uh, categories, uh, how many species are threatened, et cetera. So I advise most people who are interested in marine uh, biodiversity and conservation uh, uh, research to actually look at this uh, very updated uh, you know, report, which is available online. So you can just uh, search on Google and you will get a PDF of uh, this report. So one of the main uh, findings of this report was that um, two regions in the Western uh, Indian Ocean, one is Southern Red Sea and one is the Southern coast of India. So which we are all uh, part of, uh, com contains the highest number of threatened species in the Western Indian Ocean region. So the Southern uh, Indian coast is one of the most important areas for conservation prioritization across the Western uh, in, uh, Indian Ocean. And which is a cause for concern because uh, not much uh, conservation interventions or conservation actions are being done in this uh, region. So uh, what is the state of marine uh, biodiversity in India? So uh, we don't really have an accurate picture of how many species of uh, marine uh, organisms are found in India. So it uh, keeps uh, ranging between uh, 15,000 to 21,000 species according to many recent uh, publications. So let's say an average of 18 or 20,000 uh, species of marine uh, organisms in India, which uh, comprise 7% of global uh, marine uh, biodiversity. So India definitely is an important uh, area for the persistence and survival of uh, the world's marine uh, species. So we need to make sure that all of our biodiversity is uh, protected uh, before they reach uh, a stage where we cannot uh, recover them uh, back. So out of this, uh, say 15 or say 20,000 species, we have only managed to uh, assess uh, 2,270 species for the uh, IUCN red list, which means it's not even 10%. So it can you know, vary between 10 to 15% of the estimated marine biodiversity uh, in India. So which means we are very, very slow in uh, achieving uh, these uh, you know, conservation targets. Uh, we need to assess uh, most of uh, the marine biodiversity in India. So 90% of the marine biodiversity in India is still to be assessed by the uh, IUCN or, or on the IUCN uh, red list. And if you look at uh, taxonomic uh, uh, groups, you will uh, see that except for very few uh, taxonomic groups, uh, not much has been done uh, with regard to IUCN red list assessment. So uh, just two groups, marine mammals and turtles, are the only two groups for which all the species known from India uh, have been assessed for the IUCN uh, red list. And then I've given a, a list of uh, the number of uh, breakdown of the number of uh, species under different groups that have been uh, assessed for the uh, red list. So this is a snapshot of the uh, barometer of India's uh, marine life. Uh, so very quickly, you can have a look at, I'm not going to explain every uh, category in detail, but you can have a look and see uh, how many species of uh, marine organisms are currently listed under uh, different uh, categories of the IUCN red list. Uh, fortunately, we don't have extinct or extinct in the wild uh, species, uh, but we don't know uh, for how long, uh, given the uh, sort of pressure that uh, our uh, marine uh, ecosystems are facing. So basically, the uh, take home message here is that out of whatever has been assessed by the IUCN uh, or on the IUCN red list, 8% of uh, India's marine biodiversity is uh, threatened. So this is the pressure or the barometer uh, reading that uh, the IUCN red list uh, provides. So uh, one may think that it is not a very high number, but as I said, it is only based on uh, less than 10% of the marine biodiversity in India. So once um, you know uh, the number of uh, species or the number of uh, groups, uh, the assessments of these number of groups starts improving, then possibly this number is also going to uh, increase uh, considerably.
so uh, very quickly i'll go into different uh, groups of uh, marine organisms and what level of threats that uh, they face so marine mammals uh, as i said five species of uh, marine mammals uh, are threatened uh, 90 so 19% of all marine mammals uh, in india are threatened including uh, very uh, charismatic flagship uh, species like uh, the dugong so this uh, is another very important uh, group uh, marine turtles so all of india's marine turtles are threatened so 100% of the species of marine turtles found in india are uh, threatened so here you can see the difference between two uh, you know uh, groups uh, we have uh, 19% of threat in mammals to 100% of threat in uh, turtles so you know the contrast is uh, huge between uh, different uh, groups uh, so yeah, so all the five species are either in uh, endangered or the vulnerable uh, you know category of uh, the iucn uh, uh, red list there's also one uh, species that is critically endangered which is the hawksbill uh, turtle which is the highest level of uh, you know, conservation uh, status on the iucn uh, red list uh, corals anthozoan corals 19% of all the assessed uh, corals in india are uh, threatened so this is again uh, a cause for uh, concern another group that needs uh, conservation uh, attention uh, sea cucumbers so all, uh, 27 so 18% of the uh, echinoderms uh, in india are uh, threatened with uh, extinction but here uh, an important point that you have to uh, keep in mind is that uh, more than uh, the number of threatened species it is the data deficient species that are uh, you know a representative of this uh, group so basically because they have been poorly uh, studied poorly known in terms of uh, you know many aspects like their uh, you know distribution or you know biology and uh, threats so 27% of the uh, assessed uh, uh, sea cucumbers basically uh, are uh, under the data deficient category which means there is a scope for a lot of research to be conducted on these uh, on, on this group of uh, marine organisms so this should also be uh, read in uh, context to this uh, sort of uh, you know observations that the, the government has been making in the recent uh, years that uh, there has been a huge uh, exploitation uh, pressure on sea cucumbers a huge illegal trade in sea cucumbers happening uh, in india over the last 5 uh, years so which means that many of these uh, data deficient species could already be threatened but we don't have the information to place them under uh, different uh, threatened categories the most important uh, group as far as uh, india's marine biodiversity is concerned is uh, the sharks rays and uh, skates the basically the the chondrichthyn uh, fishes huge level of threat almost more than half of all uh, you know sharks rays and skates in india are threatened so this is the most important uh, species group that needs uh, protection in india 55% of uh, all uh, sharks rays and uh, skates are threatened in india and 20% are near threatened which means that they would uh, you know be uh, could qualify for a higher uh, red list uh, category in the uh, near uh, future so if you look at both these values you will see that almost 70% or 75% of the sharks rays and skates in india need conservation uh, attention the next uh, so mr skipping this next group is that i would like to talk about is the uh, bony fishes the most important or the most uh, i mean the large species group uh, in in india as far as uh, marine biodiversity is concerned from a, even from a commercial angle so you can see that only uh, 1% of uh, all uh, marine fishes in india are threatened but uh, this uh, masks the actual level of threat for these species basically because uh, very very few marine species marine fish species in india have been assessed so that is one uh, uh, you know issue here so uh, do not think that uh, indian marine fish are doing well because it is only uh, 1% of uh, species being threatened but there are several other uh, you know complex uh, issues there one of which is that many species are uh, data deficient which means we absolutely do not have idea about uh, their taxonomy their distribution and their uh, population and as a result uh, all these species have been uh, listed as uh, data deficient which means that there is a lot of research that need to be done on these uh, organisms for example uh, india's national fish uh, the indian mackerel rasligar kanagutta has been assessed as data deficient so one may think that we have a lot of information 
uh, over the last 50 or you know more number of years uh, on different aspects of uh, the Indian mackerel, but still uh, the uh, species is data deficient on the uh, IUCN red list. Another uh, important group uh, is the scombrids. So uh, the searfish are again another example of uh, uh, a very popular uh, group for which we think we have a lot of information, but it's still uh, data deficient on the IUCN red list. So uh, for marine fish, there are several uh, complex issues that uh, one needs to understand uh, and uh, not get uh, happy by the fact that uh, only 1% of uh, India's marine fish are uh, threatened. Another group, uh, as you can see here, is uh, the least concerned uh, species. So more than 1,000 species of uh, marine fish are currently uh, listed as least concerned, basically because uh, the taxonomy is not well known. And uh, so species that we think are uh, very widely distributed may actually be uh, a group of species or a number of species currently listed under one name, which may have uh, small distributions and uh, small localized threats. So this is one more group that we need to uh, look at in, in detail. So next I'm gonna talk about the conservation status of exploited uh, species. So uh, exploitation being one of the major threats to marine uh, biodiversity. Uh, we need to look at how exploited species uh, in India are uh, doing. So two groups uh, that I'll quickly look uh, at or uh, you know, focus on are uh, the uh, scombrids, basically tunas and allied uh, fish. 18 of these species have been assessed. Uh, just one threatened species, three near threatened species, three data division species, and uh, 11 uh, least concern uh, species. So although uh, uh, the tunas and uh, you know, allied uh, uh, species are being exploited uh, on a very large scale, they're not really uh, at a level that uh, are of uh, conservation uh, concern. The next group is the uh, saranids, the groupers. Uh, mm -hmm. But here you have more number of uh, threatened species. You have three threatened species, but uh, again, um, not much uh, cause for concern. Uh, most of them are uh, least concern uh, species. Then uh, if you look at the management uh, actions that are being uh, developed or enforced in India, basically with regard to uh, marine fish, it's the minimum uh, legal size of the MLS that has been uh, uh, developed for a large number of uh, marine exploited uh, species. And uh, this is an analysis that I looked at um, see, uh, to look at what sort of uh, threat levels uh, are there for these species with uh, minimum uh, legal size. And uh, you can see that uh, very, very few species that are actually managed uh, are uh, on the IUCN uh, red list. So most of it are uh, least concern uh, species. If you look at uh, invertebrates or vertebrates, it is uh, the least concerned species that are uh, being managed uh, with uh, different uh, fishery management uh, regulations uh, in, in the country. Uh, another group that we need to look at is the uh, Indian Wildlife Protection Act, um, the groups that are listed under the Indian Wildlife Protection Act. So uh, a few groups, uh, very important groups, uh, is the one is the seahorse. And uh, here again, uh, the whole concept of why uh, species are listed on the Indian Wildlife Protection Act uh, becomes uh, very pertinent to uh, discuss. Um, Seahorse uh, is, is basically uh, a group that definitely would need protection. Um, out of the 10 species, eight are uh, threatened and only two are uh, data deficient. So definitely, you know, if you look at this uh, sort of uh, statistics, you will uh, definitely think that uh, these species would definitely need protection because 90% uh, you know, of these species are uh, threatened on the IUCN red list. But then you also have uh, a very similar group, uh, pipefish, uh, where all of the uh, pipefish are by default uh, you know, listed under the Indian Wildlife uh, Protection Act. But uh, of the 15 species, uh, 13 species are least concerned uh, species. So you know, one then thinks why uh, least concerned species need to be listed under the uh, Indian uh, Wildlife Protection Act. So this is in complete contrast to seahorses, where I showed that uh, you know, eight out of 10 species are threatened, but here uh, 13 out of 15 species are uh, least concerned. There's another very interesting group, uh, which is under the Indian Wildlife Protection Act, which is the, uh, the Gorgonians. Uh, no. There are 150 species of Gorgonians in India. Most, I mean, all of these species are 
listed under the highest schedules of the wildlife protection act but then unfortunately uh, none of them have been uh, assessed for their extinction risk so we don't know what their uh, conservation status is and therefore the whole uh, you know rationale or justification of including uh, such species on the uh, iucn uh, sorry on the indian wildlife protection act needs uh, you know more uh, discussions and uh, you know deliberations uh, sea cucumbers uh, but this is again similar to sea horses we need protection for sea cucumbers because there are lots of uh, species that are assessed as um, you know, either endangered or vulnerable so there are groups like sea cucumbers and sea horse which definitely needs to be uh, on the red, uh, on the wildlife protection act uh, because they are certain but there are also other groups like pipe fish and uh, uh, gorgonians for which we absolutely no have in, no, do not have any idea of why they are on the red list and you know what sort of threats uh, these uh, species uh, face uh then uh, there are also groups like uh, you know many of the gastropods uh, which are on the uh, indian wildlife protection act uh, but which do not uh, have uh, a red list uh, status or which uh, are not assessed on the iucn uh, red list so this is again a, a major knowledge gap uh, that we have so uh, one may wonder why uh, the iucn red list is not used uh, for um, policy making or for conservation actions in, in many regional uh, or in the regional context uh, basically because the uh, red list looks at the global uh, picture and uh, many global uh, status may not be uh, representative of the issues locally so if there are species that are uh, you know say least concern on the global uh, scale they may have localized uh, threats in in india which makes it uh, you know difficult to uh, uh, say develop or implement uh, conservation uh, actions and then the other issue is that there is as i showed you there is a very little uh, uh, what to say uh, congruence between uh, the red list and some national policies like the indian wildlife protection act because the nasa showed you uh, there are groups that uh, may not uh, really require a protection on the indian wildlife protection act because uh, you know we do not know what sort of threats they face or the reasons why they were uh, you know put under the indian wildlife protection act in the uh, first place uh, so here are some contrasting examples of uh, global versus regional uh, you know red list uh, so the indian mackerel is uh, you know globally assessed as assessed as data deficient so throughout wherever they are found they are assessed as data deficient but in some regions they are uh, considered to be least concern so you know we have global assessments and regional assessments so we can either use one of these two to actually uh, look at uh, uh, the uh, the reasons why uh, species needs protection or uh, you know some regions you know you can have protection some you regions you do not uh, need uh, protection so we need to look at uh, the conservation status from both the global and the regional uh, perspectives so for that uh, reason the uh, the iucn has uh, a concept of national red list where uh, the iucn encourages uh, national governments or regional uh, agencies to actually look at uh, the conservation status from a local uh, perspective or from a regional perspective which might make more sense uh, for them rather than looking for a, a conservation status at a, a global uh, level so many countries have actually done uh, national uh, red listing but there are also uh, some in, uh, information or uh, some points that we need to keep in mind especially uh, for people who are not really familiar with the iucn red list so these are three main points that we need to keep in mind one is that simply compiling a, a list of uh, threatened species uh, and you know publishing a, a report is not a national uh, red list so national red list has its own uh, criteria and categories that need to be followed so most often we see lots of books saying you know uh, red list of indian uh, fish or red list of indian uh, invertebrates so they are not really uh, you know uh, actually uh, red list or uh, you know red data books that are approved by the iucn uh, by using iucn's categories and uh, criteria then uh, we also need to look at this uh, very uh, confusing concept of ret species uh, rare, rare endangered and threatened uh, species 
that is very very uh, widely used in the indian uh, you know scientific or conservation literature and even in policy making uh, you know, perspective but it's really a flawed uh, concept because you know one cannot define an anarity species in any way and they are not uh, related in any way to the iucn red list because if you uh, if you uh, remember the slide that i showed you about uh, the barometer of india's marine life you would have definitely seen that the word threatened is used in the perspective of three categories of the iucn red list so when a species is critically endangered endangered or vulnerable they are uh, together classified as or together known as threatened species so in the rt concept you have endangered and threatened so you know uh, only those people who use these uh, criteria or people who define this would know what uh, rare endangered and threatened is and uh, of course rarity is something that is very qualitative and which cannot be defined uh, you know scientifically so this whole concept of rt species according to me is completely flawed and should never be used in the indian uh, conservation uh, context so these are some of the reports of uh, regional red list uh, very good uh, reports and uh, including the latest one that i already talked to you about the uh, red list of marine uh, biodiversity of the western uh, indian ocean so this is these are really good uh, national or regional red list that uh, you can have a look at and i think it's high time that the indian uh, government uh, actually starts uh, making uh, steps to make or develop such uh, you know national and regional red list for marine biodiversity uh, in, in india so uh, last part of my talk i'll talk about i'll focus on uh, areas so there is also something that is known as the biodiversity areas so i talked to you about species protection uh, in the previous slides uh, by using uh, different uh, uh, categories of the iucn red list so we can also use the same uh, categories and of the iucn red list to identify sites uh, that needs uh, protection and one of this uh, knowledge products or the concepts that has been uh, you know widely used around the world is the key biodiversity areas so areas which needs uh, conservation attention so they have been identified in the marine terrestrial and freshwater environments uh, around the world uh, so one of so these are some of the uh, so there is this uh, world database of key biodiversity areas so you can see the uh, uh, the name on the top of my slide so if you go into that website you will get a map of all the key marine biodiversity areas that have been identified across the world so these are the snapshots of the uh, key marine key biodiversity areas around the indian coast and as you can see most of it is either on the eastern coast of uh, india or on the northwestern coast of india and if you look at this map you will see that there is absolutely no marine key biodiversity area on the southwest uh, coast of india so these are again knowledge gaps that we need to fill by working with the uh, relevant uh, iucn uh, organizations uh, but there is also uh, you know a hope uh, and uh, you know uh, potential for uh, you know in increasing this uh, key biodiversity area concepts in, in on the southwest coast of india an example is this uh, sea cucumber conservation reserve that has been you know uh, developed and coming up in in the lakshadweep uh, archipelago so that's uh, you know very hope uh, uh, what you say happy uh, and uh, news that is uh, reassuring that uh, indian marine biodiversity would uh, have a, a good uh, future so what do we need to do to improve india's parameter of marine life um, towards uh, the next 8 uh, or 10 years one is we need to work uh, in uh, tandem with the iucn um, you know uh, species survival commission with the iucn uh, red list uh, unit etc uh, basically the iucn red list uh, is uh, volunteered or carried out by a, a group that is known as the species survival commission where uh, you know, thousands of uh, volunteer scientists from around the world work uh, with the iucn uh, and uh, bring out these uh, red uh, list and uh, you know, reports that i just uh, showed you so this is a very uh, uh, interesting uh, slide that i want to show you that how uh, poorly indian scientists indian uh, experts are represented on the iucn ssc uh, specialist uh, you know, groups uh, it's it's a really unfortunate situation here that not many indian scientists are actually working with the iucn uh, red list team and its uh, and its different uh, specialist groups and you can see many uh, groups do not have any indian representative or uh, 
no uh, uh, i can say that most of these uh, representations or invitations to these committees come by uh, or, or come by invitation but uh, there are also possibilities of uh, experts uh, writing to the uh, iucn uh, you know, groups the chairs of the different uh, committees the chairs of the different groups and uh, you know volunteering their uh, services to make sure that uh, the uh, indian information the, the data from india is actually uh, available or passed on to the global uh, sort of red list uh, thing so if you go into this website you will uh, get all the information that you require for uh, you know, contacting the different uh, species specialist uh, groups the different chairs the different red list uh, authorities etc and i think this is something that uh, the, the indian scientific community should proactively uh, do so just two slides uh, to finish uh, the main uh, take home messages that i would like to uh, share uh, as part of this uh, talk is that the small number of uh, threatened species uh, is unlikely a reflection of the actual uh, state of biodiversity so you know just by having 200 uh, threatened species do not mean that india's biodiversity marine biodiversity is doing well but it is only because of the bias created by the selection of species the poor state of knowledge that we have uh, and many species are data deficient we i also talked about many species being least concerned because they are you know taxonomically not uh, properly studied and uh, many of these very widely distributed species could actually be you know a complex of different smaller uh, units which have small uh, distribution range and therefore a higher risk of uh, extinction so some of the priorities that we need to make uh, towards 2030 and to fulfill the sdg 14 agenda is that we need to develop a national and regional red list for marine taxa uh, you know give proper coverage to many of the groups that are underrepresented basically the invertebrates we need to better uh, coordinate with the iucn uh, marine conservation committee uh, the marine fish red list authorities to expand the current uh, coverage for these species we can also uh, talk to the iucn uh, make them understand the importance of uh, this region so now that we already have an iucn report saying that the southern uh, southwest coast of india is one of the hot spots for threatened species uh, in the indian ocean region we can also develop new uh, iucn specialist groups uh, focusing on the indian ocean or the western indian ocean or even marine taxonomy groups for example uh, we can you know develop a group on uh, you know indian uh, chondrichthyes fish or indian uh, conidae uh, groups so that is also something that we can uh, talk with the iucn uh, you know uh, leadership and uh, make sure that uh, things happen in, in in india we need to generate knowledge on uh, data deficient species and uh, the critically endangered uh, possibly extinct species so that is where the research comes into uh, place and we also need to uh, look at the different policies uh, as i said the indian wildlife protection act the uh, the species that are managed through uh, different regulations etc and find out how congruent the red list uh, and the actual uh, threat status of a species is and uh, the legislations and policies that are in place so i think with that i'll, I'll end my talk and if 